Hello and welcome to episode 136 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, Toyota may finally be waking up to electric car reality. Turns out they just slept through their alarm, which went off five years ago. The fully charged live show is coming to Australia. James and I are still waiting for our invite to the Canadian show, but we would love to go to Australia and hang out with our two listeners there. 87 countries hit the tipping point on clean energy, all thanks to a secret cabal of wealthy flesh-eating pedophiles. Liz Truss, the UK's solar-hating prime minister, has resigned. The new PM is Rishi Sunak, who I think is a head of lettuce. I don't know. I just wasn't really paying attention. All that and so much more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. And so I just sorry, just, I've got about a whole bunch, I was going to list all the other things that we have to talk about this week. And there's oh, a lot. Please. I'll warn you right now. There, there is a lot. Um, I apologize to Australia again for my uh, Southern Hemisphere ignorance. Uh, my city, our city buys an electric truck and we hear why they think it's a good idea. And uh, yeah, all kinds of wonderful things that we're going to have to speed through because I got a big fat show for you this week. Yes, and um, I have a big fat story for you this oh. week. I was on a lovely electric car road trip to Saskatoon, our city to the north, and uh, on the way home decided to stop in Moose Jaw, which, as we've said before, is a real place. Yes. And uh, man, I got caught in the worst blizzard I have ever been in in my entire life. Really? How? Yeah. Because I'm only 48 minutes away from there. I don't understand. What, what, why was it so bad? Yeah, well, this was a weird spring storm, or sorry, fall storm. Uh, we've had really warm weather here. Like it was plus 20 Celsius just a few days ago. And they'd had some warnings out. They called it a snowfall warning. But I have, you know, a bone to pick with Environment Canada because it really should have been a blizzard warning. So uh, they have criteria for blizzard others... warnings, Brian. It has to be windy and zero visibility and a certain temperature, depending on the region. It actually varies by region. This is our Canadian Weather Service, and it's... That's right. And I think the one thing we may not have had was temperature, yeah. because it was only around zero, but we had all the other things. So uh, we wanted to stop in Moose Jaw on the way home Why? to take a few pictures. Why? Um, it, it was for work. My partner had a, a, a bit of work to do. And it involved taking pictures in Moose Jaw. So, yeah, we, we the, the snow starts to fall and we start uh, driving in Moose Jaw. And about, you know, 30 minutes out of Moose Jaw, the, the snow was just getting super heavy and thick. And cars were going in the ditch. This is a fairly small highway, just a, like a two-lane highway. And, uh, yeah, we had to slow down to like 40 kilometers an hour, 50 kilometers an hour. Um, I just about lost control of the car at one point. It started to slide around. I managed to regain control, uh, but it was a serious white knuckle drive. Those last like 20 kilometers into Moose Jaw, we were worried we weren't going to make it. There were cars in the ditch. People and slept so, in yeah, the ditch overnight, a... man. That could have been you. Yeah, exactly. How much yeah, of a charge no, we, did you have we... at that point? I have to ask. Uh, we rolled into Moose Jaw with a 20% charge, which well, That's uh, not great. That's not great for spending the night. I, I just well, don't, know, don't, I don't understand why you thought that was a good idea, because, you know, I'm going to flash back to Friday night and the weather forecast here. <laughs> <laughs> Do know that there is a special weather statement in place through much of southern and eastern Saskatchewan, and uh, there will be major impacts along with this Natasha, including possibly some treacherous uh, conditions on the road, so people should prepare for that, and maybe some power outages, so it would be good to have an emergency kit as well. I'll have a full update coming up a little bit later. It's almost like they yeah, saw it I, coming. I heard that same report and they said, yeah, some snow and it probably won't stay around. It'll probably melt. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think we were sufficiently warned. Um, <laughs> what did they have to do? Come at you with a it taser? Should have been a blizzard warning. It should have been no, a blizzard warning. No, you stupid old man. A blizzard warning <laughs> is there for a reason. It means it's yeah. a blizzard. It yeah, doesn't it mean the blizzard. highways are not going to be passable. That could be like it could be a light freezing rain and a beautiful day. The sun could be shining and it could be just yeah. as treacherous. A blizzard warning is a blizzard warning. It, it, it was a blizzard. It, it was definitely the worst snowstorm, 
however, whatever you want to call it, the worst one I've ever driven through. And uh, we just barely made it. But And then we had to stay two nights. We had to t- stay two nights in Moose Jaw. That's absurd. Because the road was just not Did you get your pictures safe. taken at least? No, we did not. It was oh, my too, God. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll have to go back. But... Um, Yeah, we could have maybe driven back on the second day, only stayed one night, but the road was still... uh, The Moose Jaw was the epicenter for this storm. That It got around a foot of snow in Moose Jaw. And uh, yeah, but, you know, we we got to stay at the lovely Grant Hall Hotel in Moose Jaw, which is this historic hotel on, on Main Street. And we had power the whole time, but on the other side of Main Street... No power for about eight hours. Half the town was was without power, but we were uh, relaxing comfortably in in the Grand Hall Hotel. It was quite lovely. All right, I have here the blizzard uh, threshold criteria for Canada. Uh, the national, except for north of the tree line, which is well, that varies in various parts. I guess where suddenly it becomes forest and it's not prairie and whatnot. When winds of forty kilometers an hour. <laughs> That's a calm day around here, or greater, are expected to cause widespread reductions in visibility to 400 meters or less due to blowing snow, or blowing snow in combination with falling snow for at least four hours. You're right. I think it should have been a blizzard. If that's if that's all it, it is, yeah. Um, and really, the main problem was I didn't have my winter tires on yet because oh. it, it had been so warm out, and I'm usually on top of that sort of thing. So I got them put on this morning. They're yeah. on there now. Well, you're lucky. But without winter tires. It's definitely a little bit more treacherous. So winter tires is usually based on temperature when it falls below 7 degrees Celsius, which is eh, 42 Fahrenheit, I don't know, something like that. And yeah, it's, it's based on temperature. It's based on how grippy it is in temperature. But as you said, it's, but it's typical here, isn't it? It goes from summer to winter just on a flip of a coin, just instantly. Yeah. Um, yeah, well... No, that is a a lousy story because what did it add to your trip? I mean, without the picture taking, just going through that route, like, you know, how much longer it adds. It's not that much. Yeah. It's like 20 minutes or something. No, but like, you know, it was, uh, it turned out to be kind of a lovely time, you know, had some. Of course it is. When you're retired and you've got Tesla in the stock market, uh, everything's lovely when you're stranded. I was not in a hurry to get it. But most of the city didn't have power. Most of it yeah, didn't yeah. for nine hours. And some people didn't around, they couldn't get out to the, the you know, this this was an underestimated storm. I think, you know what the the reason was? Is because they expected it to be like half a degree warmer. And right. just that half a degree turned it from raining to snowing. To snow. For yeah. a longer period of time. And just, I think the fact that it was so close to zero had, you know, if this was, um, you know, Minus 20, like way below zero, way below freezing. Uh, the snow yeah. would be snow and powdery, and but this was wet yeah. and icing and, you know, it's slush. And exactly. Messy. Yeah, messy no, stuff. I've driven through lots of blizzards before, but it's usually colder than that. And, uh, you know, it's it's annoying, but it's fine. Okay. Um, I was watching uh, television the other day, and you know how I say that I see EV commercials when I watch football games? I realized it's everywhere. It's not just football yeah. games. I've been watching a lot of Netflix lately, so I haven't watched too much TV. But I've noticed it's nothing but EV commercials. And yeah. there was this moment the other day when the wife says to me, uh, you know, after the umpteenth EV commercial, how, she says, how does it feel to see the prophecy you made uh, many years ago come <laughs> true? Like, <laughs> and it's true. Yeah. I mean, we've been on the air doing this for almost a quarter decade now. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, for 10 years before that, uh, you and I would talk about this stuff and, and we would follow this stuff. And, and certainly for 20 years back, you know, well, my whole life, but there wasn't much to follow yeah. <laughs> until mm-hmm. uh, the 21st century came around and, and EV started to show up in different forms. So, yeah. And, and we we did predict all this. I mean, you and I personally did. And we went on other people's who know better than us predictions. And it all made sense to us. And we had evidence to back it up for different reasons. And then we became EV owners. And we realized, well, if, why would you want to drive anything else? And that's what most people yeah. don't get. They don't get how great EVs are and how they are superior yeah. to gas vehicles. Uh, and why would you want to drive anything else? So, yeah, I love my car. And... 
God willing, it keeps working. Now, I, I have a weird caveat to that story. So I was uh, watching the Straight Pipes on YouTube, my favorite car review channel, friends of the show. Yuri's been on the show. And uh, they had a review of the new Mercedes-Benz EQS, electric, fully electric SUV. And, you know, it, it's a very expensive car, you know, lovely Mercedes. But there's a new trend now in um, electric cars or cars of all kinds, particularly like Mercedes and BMW seem to be doing that, is uh, subscriptions. you got to pay subscription fees for certain features. So we've got a clip here. The thing that I don't like about this is OTA downloads. You have to pay... All over the air you have to pay for certain features that you get into the future that you didn't pay for when you bought this car from the dealership. So like hardware features that the car can do and have, but you didn't pay for. Yes, so you pay a yearly subscription fee to some of those features. Now there are three features I'd like to point out. Number one, trailer maneuvering assist. You can pay per year for the car to help you do that. Okay. Uh, number two, is augmented reality navigation. If you want to see all that cool stuff. You that, can that I can kind of understand that because like maps change and stuff, whatever. Yes, and the third one being extra degrees of rear steering angle. Yeah, now, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm done. That, 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 that hit me and I'm like, no. That doesn't make any sense. What the hell? Yeah, that's the weirdest one. So the car has got four wheel steering, so the rear wheels will turn to, to you know shorten your turning radius. But to get extra degrees... You have to pay to your obviously. rear wheels. That's you have just to pay up, man. That is that just... Extra year. Yeah. I mean, it was frustrating now, enough when they, somebody started charging for heated seats as a subscription. <laughs> but this is, you know... And I guess the sort of, to, to play devil's advocate, I, you know, a lot of people who buy a Mercedes or a BMW, I guess, are rich and maybe they don't care. But that one particularly just seemed weird. And then the trailer assist, too, because that's kind of like a safety feature, you know. Like, you want to be able to help your drivers, you know, pull a trailer as, as safely as possible. So that that seems a weird one to have to What's pay. next? Airbags? Uh, you won't be able to do up your seatbelt <laughs> unless you pay us a fee? You... Jeez. Yeah, it'll, it'll do an instant payment just before the, the airbag goes off. Well, there's at least one jurisdiction in the United States uh, who wants to outlaw this type of thing yeah but you have to wait till lightning round to find out who okay the results may surprise and, uh, you i've got just one more thing this is a follow-up to last week of course we had our exciting new segment brian's book report last week exciting as hell yes and yeah i talked about ducks the new graphic novel from kate beaton which is about two two years in the oil sands uh, she worked in the oil sands here in alberta and canada and wrote an amazing memoir about that time and uh, I just wanted to mention that she's on a cool book tour where um, she's got a slideshow. She's got a musician from Cape Breton coming with her on this book tour. So if you're interested, Vancouver is November 1st, Los Angeles, November 2nd, Seattle, November 3rd, Portland, Oregon, November 5th, Calgary, November 7th, Winnipeg, November 8th. And um, I might even go to the one in Winnipeg because I'm Lord retired. Man. What else have I got to do? Um, this podcast? Oh, right. I forgot about that. I'm not allowing you to go unless you get an interview with her. Uh, well, then I, you know, I don't want to bug her. She seems busy. She seems busy. She's doing a book tour. <laughs> That's what the book tour is for, is to, to do interviews, to do press. I'm sure she'd be happy with the okay. press. Well, I'll get our, our, You're just get being our lazy. intern. To, That's what you are. You're our just intern a, can set up an interview there. Oh, I'm sure. You can just throw it a nice little tweet request, Um, you know. And if she says nothing or no, okay, so you move on. You move on. We'll see. But you know, get her to sign something, at very least. I don't Your book. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I Now uh, it is time for me to once again apologize to Australia. Uh, my daughter, uh, 14 years old, on the phone all the time, on, on, you know, apps and games and things, has friends in Australia for some reason, which is not good because we are in a very different time zone than Australia. Sure. So my the child, opposite. my teen, my um, high school student is staying up all night because of this. This is one reason why oh, she doesn't do well uh, those with Damn sleep. Australians. Yes, it's their fault. If she ever goes missing, I have to go all the way to Australia to look for her. So that's Man. not good. Um, yeah, so uh, she said that something to me that seemed absurd. And she said, um, two out of three people in... Australia will be diagnosed with skin cancer. 
by the time they're 75 or 70 or something like that. And I thought, no, uh -huh. that's wrong. <laughs> Did you check that your sources? Because I'm, yeah. I'm good at getting my kids to be skeptical. Um, you yeah. know, to have skepticism. This is something you can not teach your kids enough, especially in the world that we exist in now. <laughs> and mm -hmm. So she's good at that. And uh, damned if she wasn't right, Brian. Apparently, I, I found <laughs> multiple sources that say that that's true. Um, but it's still... Wow. And I, okay, so whether it's true or it's just high, let's just go there. Why is it high? I thought, okay, Australia, it's, it's, they don't quite have, they don't have winters. You, you know, they get snow in some places and high elevations, but for, and they're opposite, obviously, uh, to our climate. And, but I always associated them with being close to Antarctica because you go through Australia to get to Antarctica. But they are as close to the equator as you and I are to Denver. It's a day's drive huh. to the, if you could drive, if there okay. was a road, you could drive in 13 hours or, you know, 12 hours yeah. to the equator. That's really close. That's the, So it's hot and sunny is what you're saying. Well, yeah. And that's why I, I had this misconception uh, about the Southern Hemisphere. And, you know, I was shocked and kind of embarrassed by, about how much I learned from The Long Way Up, which you mentioned on last week's show, which is a motorcycle, EV motorcycle, in this case, travel log from the southern tip of South America up to Los Angeles. And I, I was amazed at everything, and I realized I don't know anything about it. Um, and I realized there's this ignorance that we have in the northern hemisphere about the southern hemisphere. My son points out that it's mostly ocean, Dad. Don't worry. <laughs> so I looked at, <laughs> you know, bias, and I got this uh, Wikipedia page, and it shows the, I tweeted this out, the, uh, the hemisphere, if the globe was upside down, if we uh, if we put them first, and it's really there's not much there. It's mostly ocean, and I don't know. I just I, I apologize for being ignorant about it. And yes, if you send us there, uh, we will certainly learn a lot more than we do because uh, Australia is kind of like a sister country to us. They're they're in the Commonwealth yeah. of uh, England, and they have a queen or king now, and you know we we were about the yes. same population size roughly. Yeah, about the same number of people down there in Australia. And yes, we would love to go. Please invite us to fully charged Australia as well as fully charged Canada. But do you admit that there's a a bias, an ignorance about the Southern Hemisphere from a lot of people? Well, I know I'm ignorant about it, but, you know, uh, I'm, I, you know, geography's never been my strong suit. Well, I'm just amazed at how close it is to the equator. And, and no wonder they have, you know, the solar potential they have. I thought it was just you yeah. know, kind of desert, sunny days, dry climate, but it's, it is close to the equator. No, and we have pretty hot, sunny summers here as well, so I'm a little worried about my own skin as I get older. Oh. Um, you know, I'm definitely going to get checked because yeah. I got a lot of sun exposure when I was a kid. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always good to get uh, things checked out, especially if uh, a mole is bothering you or anything like that. And you can always get your partner to take a picture of it and compare it to the internet. Send it to your doctor, <laughs> all kinds of things you could do. Uh, another thing that I was surprised by was uh, from the Canadian Renewable Energy Association. They, re they represent all the people who install solar and wind and everything else. They said that Canada will need 10 times more wind and solar energy supported by energy storage like batteries to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Now, they implied that that was a lot, and I was thought, well, it must be at least 100 or 1,000. You know, like it just it doesn't seem like we have any, but yeah. to make it only 10 times more, it seemed like we're so far behind. We just were at the tip of the iceberg of what we need, but 10 times doesn't seem that much in 30 years. Yeah, I guess our problem maybe here in Canada is, as we've said before, we've got a largely clean grid. We have tons of hydroelectric and nuclear, so not, no greenhouse gas emissions. It's like something like 82% clean, our grid here in Canada. But maybe that kind of makes us uh, lazy and complacent, like replacing that. We're not only going to have to replace that 20% that's, that's dirty, but as we've said many times, energy use is going to go up a lot in the next uh, little while. So if we don't start deploying this stuff more quickly and, uh, you know, we could be in trouble. Oh, there was a CBC opinion piece on the grid adaptation needed for electric vehicles in the city of Calgary, Alberta. And the 
the person knew what they were talking about. They mentioned a lot of the same things that you and I talk about on the show as a potential solution, such as charging at night, such as uh, charging when there's extra solar and a smart grid and the smart home chargers and stuff like that. Uh, but he also mentioned studies that said that EVs only charge for two hours a day. Uh, and most people charge at five o'clock at night when they get home. Um, now, that's a problem because that's the peak time of day, right? If everybody plugged in their EV and it sucked mm -hmm. in six kilowatts, that would be a problem. I don't charge at that time. I set my charger to, to be charged by the morning to spend as much time as it needs, but it's charged in the morning. The reason I do that is because I make this assumption that the grids may be cleaner at night where we are because we have a lot of coal on the the, the, the grid. So I, I figure that maybe it's cleaner at night uh, because the renewables are more into the mix. The other reason I do that is because I think that while well, I'm giving my battery a break, instead of like discharging it and then charging it up all in one thing, I give it, you know, maybe it'll help with the longevity. Regardless, it usually doesn't matter. So, however, I got to thinking, um, AC, air conditioning, is like one kilowatt to three kilowatts for an AC compressor to run. And if you've got mm -hmm. a heat wave, then, you know, the peak is going to be about five o'clock at night when people come home from work and cool down their homes. Or if yeah. they're already cooling them, it'll be the hottest part of the day in the summer. So what's really the difference? I mean, the grid, yeah, in California had some close calls, and so did Texas from heat waves. But it's not that big of a deal if, you know, if it can ha – we've handled heat waves just fine. Uh, electric car charging I don't think will be even as bad as a heat wave because people can be, if they're not already, told to charge at night, incentivized to charge at night um, with, clean, you know, cheaper electricity, which is a, a no-brainer. And yeah, I, I don't, I wonder sometimes, I, all I'm saying is I'm skeptical about the, mm -hmm. the warnings that people throw up about, oh, the grid's not going to be able to handle EVs. And none of this is going to happen overnight. So, we, you know, we've got several years to keep working on this and, and hopefully nip it in the bud before it becomes a problem. Okay. Here's some, uh, <laughs> here's some things I wanted to, to throw in as well. Okay. I saw a commercial on television with an EV charging that wasn't an EV commercial. Or a car commercial. Okay. I think that's a, a turning point um, of, yeah. wow. Like, I, that kind of really blew my mind. It really sunk in that this is normalized now. You know, I, I can't remember what commercial was. I'm sorry. I went looking and I couldn't find it again. But it's interesting. But the idea being that the advertisers of whatever product want to associate themselves with, they want to make their product seem cool, so they included an EV charge. Yeah, we are not old-fashioned. We are progressive. We are moving forward. Yeah. And the people who like our brand are, they're not old people. They're younger with, um, with you know, perhaps climate on their mind. And it wasn't a climate. It wasn't a greenwashing commercial. It was just a product commercial. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that was very cool. Did you know that there is more Hyundai dealerships in Florida than there are Ionic 5s? Somebody threw <laughs> out that fact the, on Twitter the other day. Uh, this is our ongoing concern that I have, at least, of the number of Ionic 5s that are being made. I'm told two to three years, different people have heard different things. Uh, well, mm -hmm. Come on, Hyundai. Why? 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 And it pisses me off because they're advertising them constantly. And it's a great car, and they're not selling them. Um, there was a Twitter thread that I saw on Tesla's demand where um, sort of a, a person, a logistics person said, don't expect too much semi-demand because people uh, who own rigs have to test them out. It takes time for them to assess them and to sort of see what the maintenance schedule is. There's going to have to be a team of maintenance people. I don't think we've talked about that. Uh, I don't know if the Tesla shops are going to do the maintenance or who, but somebody has to. It has yeah, to be they've ready. been doing some hiring for that, but we don't know how that's going to work yet. So, yeah, that's, they just said, you know, it, it could really take off, but it could be kind of sort of plateaued a bit after the first rush of, of orders, you know, the first... I'm sure they'll be busy for many years, uh, tr yeah. just trying to keep up to what their initial demand is, the the 200 that you know one company buys and one grocery store chain buys and so on. And if you've just spent a couple hundred thousand on a new diesel rig, you kind of have to pay that off, presumably, for a few years before you can 
uh, get into something else. But yeah, Tesla did say they're going to try and make 50000 a year. Um, that would be by, I don't know, by the end of next year at that kind of rate. Yeah. So I was watching the local news, the same local news where that uh, weather report was on. And I saw that uh, at North Portal, Saskatchewan, which is on the North Dakota border, it's a, it's a border crossing. That's one of the two main ones that we have here when we go to the States. Uh, you and I, I believe, went through there on our way to Fargo Film Festival one year. Yep, for uh, sure. This is a very popular crossing with a lot of trucks. And I guess the Canadian government put some money into it and redid it. And what struck me and what really wasn't mentioned in, in any of the press releases or stories is, other than a brief passing message, that they put solar panels up. But they had a, a video of the solar panels, and they're vertical. They're on the side of a building. And mm -hmm. I'm very curious as to the reasoning for that. I mean, uh, it's a tall warehouse-like building, you know, with big bays in it that you go into with like a semi-truck for getting <laughs> searched for drugs. And I'm watching mm -hmm. uh, some drug shows on Netflix right now. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> so you could squeeze a lot of panels on there, but they, they're expertly done and they're, they're just, you know, they take up all the space of the side of the building perfectly and um, yeah, I just thought that was an interesting choice and man, I'd like to know why, like that's a, because that was the only place or, uh, is it power? Is there a battery backup? You know, cause the, the border operations have to keep going and power outages and things like, I'd like to know more. Why, why was yeah. border crossings a priority for solar? No, if anyone knows, let us know. But I, I certainly the one argument I can think of is that yes, if there is battery backup or something and they, they need to run it 24 hours, that would be really good for the winter because, of course, the sun is really low in the sky where we live. And so vertical panels would do the best job of charging up those batteries in the winter. And uh, maybe they don't need that, that much power in the summer. I don't know. Just a thought. Another update uh, I would like to throw at you is that Electric says the Ford F-150 Lightning all-electric pickup truck is lightly sold out for at least two years. And also, they updated the long-range 0 to 60 time over, well, I guess they never really announced it, but apparently it's under four seconds, which is more than they initially promised, so that's pretty cool. That's crazy for a huge, heavy vehicle I mean, like that. I don't know what that would feel like, because you're not like in a sports car <laughs> close to the ground, you're in this big, heavy thing way off the ground, and then <laughs> you're going like Porsche 0 to 60 times pretty much. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's just, you know, for all the males who own a truck out there, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you want that. You want it. You want a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, savings. Anyway, uh, I also, Brian, I have a story here from our city, who um, we're about a two hundred thousand or so people, quarter million city. They bought an electric F one fifty pickup truck, and there was, you know, they got the press together and did stories on it. Um, so they think they're going to save forty thousand dollars a year. With, they only got a hold of one, by the way. They tried to get five. They only got a hold of one. Yeah. They think the $40,000 a year in gas savings on paper. They say that's what it is on paper, plus maintenance savings that they'll have to study. So they're going to study it. And uh, yeah, they got it last week. And I wasn't, it was only a month ago that they ordered it. So they got like maybe somebody canceled their order or something, but they got lucky, I think. And uh, they got all kinds of stickers on it and, you know, the, the whole uh, advertising that it's electric for the city. Um, yeah, supply chain issues are apparently involved. The internal combustion engine, I guess, version is about thirty-seven thousand. So they say the the yeah forty thousand on fuel annually. That's a lot of driving. Well, I don't I don't know if you've noticed. Yeah, I mean, depending on if it's gasoline or diesel, I don't know the price of diesel. I don't know if you noticed has been a lot higher than the price of gas. They're usually about the same around here. The price of gas has come down quite a bit, but the price of diesel is still up around yeah. two bucks a liter. So um, I could certainly see, you know, busy city vehicle driving around doing maintenance stuff all day. Yeah, 40 grand a year. And, and idling in the wintertime. They'll probably be running all day, even if they're not moving. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what department's yeah. going to use it. I think just a general department. It'd be nice if, you know, they, they spread it around and let different, uh, uh, you know, heads of departments, you know, use it for like a week or two at a time and just sort of get used to it. So, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a 90% reduction in energy costs on paper. So that's quite something. 
And they also added the very, it's almost like they listened to this podcast. They said, as the price of EVs come down and the price of fuel rises, the argument just gets better and better. So this is something we've talked about since day one of the podcast, the whole economics of it. It's just going yeah. to, once, yeah, I wouldn't have expected our city to, to sort of be talking that way, but you know, if we can, then everyone can, because we're yeah. backwoods here. Yeah, you know, when you compare energy systems, things like solar and wind, uh, there's no fuel cost yeah. at all. <laughs> oh, you remember when we were talking about uh, electric scooters in India, the uh, Ola S1, which was a kind yeah. of a big breakthrough, and we did uh, some coverage of that a year ago when they were starting to move the date, because they made this giant gigafactory to make... You know, because two and three wheel transportation is king in India. That is what you have to tackle in order to get the air cleaner. And yeah, they've got this big factory with only women in it. It's so interesting that they've chosen only women to work in the factory. Hmm. And um, for okay. reasons that they think that, you know, they're just trying to, to, to level the playing field of society a little bit. And they gave women jobs. Uh, so yeah. But now they're coming out with sort of a pared down version of that scooter, which is $960 US. Uh, that's if you put down a deposit today. That's but cheap. it's limited to, well, I guess their other scooter did was like $1,700 US to start with. They think the prices will be coming down. And it did 115 kilometers per hour, which is uh, 70 plus miles per hour. So it's highway 70, speed, 70 sort of. miles, yep. So, which is scary for a scooter. <laughs> yeah, I uh, don't want to, but so the uh, yeah, this it's they call it the S1 Air, and it comes with a smaller 4.5 kilowatt motor and peaks at 85 kilometers an hour, which is 53 miles per hour. And it's more of a city scooter, uh, but they're making lots of these things. It only has a hundred kilometer range at best, and there's no swappable batteries on these, which I wish there were. Um, so Geely is the company that does that in, in Asia, right? And they're starting to bring those in places to Europe. I think that's a great idea. And it may be suitable for some people and not for others. But yeah, it actually charges fairly fast. So, And they do have a charging network. So yeah, that's just one thing. Now, do you want to talk yeah. about uh, Miss Truss, who is gone? Um, yeah, so... UK, they had a new prime minister just a couple of months ago. We made fun of her immediately because she was mocking solar panels out in fields, which she thought was ugly. And uh, so I think <laughs> you and I can take credit for her. We're a very powerful show. Just 44 days as, yeah, just 44 days as the UK's prime minister. Now, there were other issues. It wasn't really her complaining about solar panels. Um, she, her economic policies did not go over well and seemed to uh, tank the UK economy. I think that was maybe her main issue. Well, let me, let me give but, you some um, background yeah, on, on her environmental stuff, because I've, I've written down some of it from The Guardian. It says the, the ministers, yeah. her ministers, seem determined to rip up environmental protections, but they were facing a lot of resistance from an extraordinary alliance of wildfire, wildlife charities and green-minded conservatives. Uh, so they had a, announced a bewildering range of measures to reach its holy grail of economic growth, growth rather, and squarely at trashing the environment. They seem to do it on purpose. And, you know, there's a lot of conservative people in Britain who are pro-environment, uh, like the royal family, for example, who are f yeah. quite conservative, but actually do care about the environment because uh, they're very in touch with it. Yeah, I guess that doesn't seem to be the case around here, so that's not something I guess something she I proposed a public think of. information campaign on energy savings and but refused to address uh, insulation for Brit Britain's drafty homes. I guess uh, that's a bigger issue in Britain than it is here because people sort of, you know, it doesn't get quite as cold in Britain, but it is uh yep. so they just turn up the heat and they manage to survive. So, yeah, it's the surest way to bring down bills would have been to insulate homes, but she just, you know, wasn't, she didn't listen to the science. She didn't listen to the experts and she sought mm -hmm. to block the development of solar farms inexplicably. And so Rishi Sunak, um, the head of lettuce that is now, um, prime minister. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out that he got a two out of five score. Uh, no, he, he got, 
a three out of five score from The Guardian on climate. And uh, Truss only got uh, two out of five, okay? But Boris, <laughs> Boris got four out of five. Okay. So make fun of his hair and his uh, wow. ineptness. The, and we have, <laughs> oh, but we have. he was strong on the environment, especially for conservative PM. So, yeah. So uh, this getting back to Sunak, I was interested in what. Well, he's rich, so he has no connection to anything. Let's face it; he's not going to last. He's he's a billionaire, okay. <laughs> but he stood in the way of policies that would have reduced greenhouse gas emissions in the past, but in a at an upfront cost to the Treasury, chief among them a nationwide program of insulation to replace the botched Green Homes Grant. Uh, I guess he stood in the way of that. So that was a serious mistake. Um, but, you know, he's a little bit better than the last person. At least he's not talking about ungodly looking solar panels on farms. And now that's that wrong somehow and that we should go backwards. So that's a, it's a plus. One candidate, by the way, who was vying for PM got a zero on climate, so <laughs> she didn't get in. But what else do you have to say <laughs> on it? No, nothing. I want to move on to fully charged Australia, although I don't really have too much more to say. So fully charged, this comes from Robert Llewellyn's uh, YouTube channel, and they do these live shows that are like an expo of clean, green uh, energy and technology. And they announced recently they were going to do a show in Canada next year and uh, now they're going to do one in Australia and uh, yeah I just think this is uh, super fun and interesting and, and I'm hoping that you know uh, you and I can make it there to the one in Canada. It's and a long knows, trip and Australia. remember to bring uh, sunscreen if we do go um, because it's very close to the equator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah it's a hell of a trip to Australia. Like, I know because my daughter looked it up because she wants to go there which is wrong. It's not a good idea. Yeah, no. I would like to go someday. Uh, I've never well. been. I, I have plenty of people I know. Like Australia is like uh, this fanciful land that everybody wants to go to, that in New Zealand. So I've got young people I know and relatives mm -hmm. and nieces and nephews that have gone. Uh, my, my nephew actually made the international news uh, when he went there because, uh, oh, I forget what, some tide took him out to sea or something or... And, and, uh, oh no, uh, and he fought <laughs> off a shark with his foot. I can't remember, but there was some story that was, uh, yeah, uh, I wish I could remember, but yeah, that's just kind of funny. It sounds like a typical day yeah, in Australia. But, you know, when my family member goes there, the other side of the world, and it makes international news, that's just typical anyway. Well, good luck <laughs> to them. Uh, I would, I, I don't know if I could handle the plane flight, honestly, like that's a long way. It's got to be 24 hours of flying. Yeah, it's, it is about that. Until we have the flight, Clean yeah. Energy Show private jet uh, fueled by um, solar panels, maybe we could get our own solar plane. Oh, and by the way, I looked into it this week because, like, I've always wanted to do, like, maybe a transatlantic crossing on a ship, like go from New York to London on a ship, because I, d I don't really like flying. That's also kind of an unpleasant flight. But I checked into it, and unfortunately, the carbon footprint is much worse if you really? take a ship than flying. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you're, you're just burning a massive amount of diesel fuel. It takes about six days to cross the ocean. And, you know, obviously, a plane uses a lot of fuel, but it's done in just a few hours. So it's, it's about double the carbon footprint if you want to take That's a ship. That's amazing. Over to Europe. Double. Wow. That should be a story. Uh, um, yeah. Not to mention the other issues, you know, they, they, there's waste issues with cruise ships where they're possibly just dumping their waste out in the ocean, which is not ideal. Wow. I mean, airplanes the, the don't think do of your weight compared to the ship, but then you probably got like five people. You've got a magician, you've got a chef, you've got, you know, all kinds of porters and things <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, a comedian. Yeah. I, I always no, travel I mean, with a personal but, magician. You know, they sure. put all those people on the ship. There's only like four or five flight attendants yeah. and a couple of pilots on a, on a jet. But I would think that your weight ratio to the yeah. jet, which has to get off the ground, oh, it's just mind blowing that I twice as bad. Wow. Well, maybe yeah. you have to wait for hydrogen ships then or something like that. <laughs> wow. Um, well, I saw that one of the Chinese automakers had a, an electric. Uh, they turned a car into a, basically a drone 
the it looks like a drone, but they, their car has this optional drone thing, which can go 100 kilometers, and they demonstrated it. It's really weird to see a car fly. It's really that was it's on electric. Go check it out. It's on electric yeah. today. But um, anyway, sure. okay. So Reuters has a story on Toyota. This made a lot of waves for people like you and me and our listeners who know that Toyota is slipping up. Um, they are basically stopping their EV plants. Okay. Um, Because they, they want, want to start, start over. Here's Reuters uh, talking about it. They say the automaker could rewrite its $38 billion plan for electric cars in a bid to catch Tesla. While a working group looks into that, Toyota has reportedly suspended some of the 30 EV projects announced in December. The revamp could slow the rollout of cars already under development. So basically they've come to a, an apparent realization. This is backed up by... Minimum of four sources on each point. Some of them have more sources. So this is a legitimate thing. Um, they had a, a $38 billion EV rollout plan, which apparently was planning to take decades because EVs weren't going to take off for decades. This is from not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so a working so group thought. within Toyota has been charged with outlining new plans by early next year for improvements to his existing platform. Um, this could mean that they dump everything and, and make a platform and start over again, but they're panicking. They're realizing, uh, apparently it was triggered largely by Toyota engineers realizing that Tesla with its, um, giga press, you know, making one giant piece instead of a whole bunch of little pieces and putting them together and saving money that way, yeah. they realized, oh, well, we're not, we're not going to be able to compete against that. Yeah, and Toyota has been known as the cost king. They are the kings of car manufacturing up until now in terms of cost. They've they've been the best at it. They've been making the most cars, and they've been dominating the industry for a, a long time well, now. Well, that's pathetic, isn't it? I mean, they thought that it was <laughs> not going to take off for decades. <laughs> Toyota, what's wrong with you? They would need to sell about 3.5 million EVs a year, roughly one third of its current global volume by 2030 to stay competitive. So one in three cars would have to be fully electric. Uh, I would suggest that two thirds are what other automakers, some autom other automakers are going to be selling. I would guess that Ford and GM will be selling two out of three cars will be fully electric at 2030 uh, on the trajectory. Now, this is, you know barring nuclear war and, and, and authoritarianism in the United States and all kinds of things that could or could not happen. And, you know, God help us. But uh, they may opt for an EV-dedicated platform engineered from the ground up, and I think probably they should do that. But, I mean, I have to ask, Brian, what about your sourcing of minerals for batteries? I mean, that's if you're not locking that up, you're way all behind. And that yeah. is it's, it's scary and depressing, actually. It's sad. Yeah, and when you need to operate at the level that Toyota operates, which is currently the biggest car manufacturer in the world. So they don't just need a few batteries. You know, a company like Mazda is pretty small. Um, they they don't need as much. But uh, Well, they're oof, talking Toyota about, you know, four or five years way to go. from now um, of getting, you know, just getting this thing started, you know, getting the cars out there. And by then yeah. I could be on my second Chevy. You know, I mean, I could be, like, yeah. loyal to a god-awful brand that I don't care for. Um, you know, just because, yeah. <laughs> and, and they, uh, I remember them saying, well, we can switch on a dime if there's ever demand for EVs. It won't be, yeah, well, tell that to your battery chain, your supply chain for batteries, because that's a big yeah. difference. No, and we have a sort of an addendum to this story about uh, Stellantis, uh, formerly known as Fiat Chrysler, because they were in sort of a similar position. Uh, this is what their CEO said just a little while ago. He said, what is clear is that electrification is a technology chosen by politicians, not by industry. So this is what Stellantis was saying uh, not that long ago. But they have changed their tune. So the new quote uh, from the chief operating officer is, <laughs> the people have decided we will be purely electric. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But yeah, this is certainly the refrain was from a lot of the laggards. <laughs> a lot of the laggards were just complaining that this was being forced down their throats by government and by policy. Um, but as we just said earlier, once you drive an electric car, you know it's better. And that's wow. what the people are going to want. Let's just... Just wow! That's just—I can't believe that. It's just—it's stunning, stunning, and 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 you know, incumbents—they are the people who uh, who get screwed if they don't—they uh, get, you know, replaced. Yeah, no, Toyota's going to have a real struggle to turn All that right. ship so around. So let's move on to the next thing. So uh, I thought this was a really interesting story from uh, the Renew Economy website. And um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because the headline is kind of the best thing about it is the headline on Renew Economy, energy loss is the single biggest component of today's fossil-based electricity system. So um, as we often talk about, you know, like an electric car is just way more efficient in terms of its energy than a gasoline car. A lot of the energy in the gasoline just gets wasted as heat. There's so much excess heat so uh, if you think about it, an entire system, an electricity system based on fossil fuels, um, you know, you're just wasting most of the energy. The, most of the energy does not get converted to electricity. So uh, for natural gas, 56% of the energy is lost. Uh, for coal, it's wow. 68% of the energy is lost. And even with nuclear, 67% of the energy is lost. Um, that one I'm a little more confused about. I don't know how that works exactly, but you know, all of these things, um, yeah, it's it's very inefficient. So not only are we burning all these fossil fuels, most of them are now. Just this being brings to mind some of the stories we talked about over the summer, where nuclear plants and even coal plants had to shut down in certain places uh, because the water that they put into the rivers that they were, you know, France, I think, is an example. We're making the rivers too hot. The rivers, due to climate change already on this particular summer, were too hot, and they, right. they had to shut down because they couldn't make them hotter because it would destroy the ecosystems. Um, so yeah, and I, even yeah. in Saskatoon, a small city where we live, um, my son always points out the power plant there puts really hot water into the river, and that affects certain things. Like the locals there yeah. apparently talk about this stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I guess you're wasting that. Yeah. You're, you're not recycling it as much if it's really, really hot, uh, or if it goes up in steam, then, you know, I don't know, maybe they're not, they're not efficient because they don't have to be, or they don't. Yeah. And uh, further on the article here, like, it, you know, we know that like something like a solar panel is not, you know, a hundred percent percent efficient, like 24% efficiency for a solar panel is, is sort of typical. So you might think, oh, okay, well, that's, that's as wasteful as, you know, it's as inefficient as these other things. But as I, I said off the top of the show, the fuel costs are yeah. exactly zero. You don't have to worry about fuel costs. So it doesn't matter if it's only 24% um, you efficient. You know, there's a podcast I was listening to this morning at the gym. I have to look it up. Looking it up now, I'm holding it up on my phone. Which one was it? Um, it was the Energy Viz Climate Podcast hosted by my possible cousin, Ed Whittingham. He calls himself Whittingham. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But he had on mm -hmm. somebody from the Energy Gang, which is one of the top uh, climate podcasts there is, and it's an American. So the, a lot of these podcasts are very in the weeds. They're for people who work and do policy for climate, and mm -hmm. they're not for, we're for the people. We're for the people. <laughs> clearly, clearly. Yeah. Uh, even in Australia. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, most of it goes over my head. Um, but, uh, you know, they were talking about this very thing that there was this, um, this, this figure about, uh, for instance, oil, uh, it's the number of barrels that you would need to make the oil, uh, for what you get out of it. And the ratio there is, yeah. Uh, four barrels to make 10. And with solar, it was one. And they, they, they did, the person that was talking about these new studies that uh, were looking at this. And apparently the threshold is like one to 10 or 10 to one. And that's where renewables are or better. And it's diminishing returns after that. 
But if at, at the point of oil, and it gets worse, of course, with the oil sands in Alberta because it's harder to extract that, takes more yeah. energy to extract that. So, and, and they're talking from the point of view of investment, which is really important because it, it just goes to show how um, numbers like this will show that the um, the investment in renewables is is way better. By the way, yeah, with a fuel cost of zero. Now uh, you I, can't I've go got wrong. so much on the show this week that you know I, I only put stuff on the show that I'm interested in. Usually we do. Some, sometimes we put on stuff that we <laughs> update past stories because we want to make sure that we're clear on everything that we talk about. Um, but everything, there's so much that has interested me this week, Brian, that I just have to skim through it all really quickly. Um, uh, BBC had a, a story on wind Please. turbines and, um, yeah, so the total pipeline of wind turbines that are floating, cause that's something that kind of interests me cause there's a floating wind turbines are just coming online now cause that opens up deeper oceans that are more than 60 meters deep. So there's a lot of coastlines that that could cover, um, and apparently they're not passive. These structures are not passive. They actually, trans, they're like a tripod with three floating, you know, sections at the bottom. And they transfer okay. water or weight to different ones. They're, they're computer controlled and they will transfer so they keep them upright and to fight the wind and, the, and different things like that. So a network of pumps and valves shift a liquid ballast between the three floating cylinders to rebalance the platform. And below the surface, weighted subsea cables attached to huge anchors on the bottom of the ocean make sure the platform is firmly secured to the seabed. Now, that reminds me, years and years ago on PBS, there was a show called Skyscraper, or it was a documentary series about building this new skyscraper in Manhattan. This was about 25 years ago. And the building in question, don't remember the name of it, but it had a sort of a, uh, like a triangle shape on the top of it. But the building had a counterweight on the top of the building that would slide back and forth. Yes. So like tall yeah, skyscrapers. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember that? <laughs> tall skyscrapers will blow around in the wind, like, you know, as much as a few inches. And this is planned for, and this is built into the structure. But this one particular building, they put a giant floating kind of, it was on some kind of a slippery rolling surface, and it would counterweight as the building, you know, swayed back and forth. This weight on the very top of the building would counteract the, I just thought that was wild. So this sounds yeah. like this is something similar. And I, I, I don't think that's unique to that building. I think there's a lot of really tall skyscrapers that have that. Uh, and and yeah. God help you if that mm -hmm. system breaks down. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that system to break yeah. down <laughs> or just get out of the building. I guess, you know, the building can handle it, but this sort of makes it less nauseating uh, because they, they will, they have to give mm -hmm. at a certain point. Um, okay. So it's time for the tweet of the week. And coming up soon is the lightning round. We're going to breeze through the rest of the headlines, but right now I've got the tweet of the week. A relatively new feature. This is from Simon Evans, PhD. He has got um, uh, expertise in this area of clean energy. He says, wow, China just built more offshore wind capacity in the year of 21, uh, 2021 alone than the rest of the world had managed in the last five years combined. So, you know, we criticize, China is uh, politically criticized for, you know, having a lot of emissions and growing emissions and they're still building coal but they're building a lot of wind capacity, and that brings the prices down and also increases the learning curve for improving mm -hmm. those things. So it's 26 gigawatts now in China, and that accounts for half, nearly half the world's 54, uh, well, more than half of, no, almost half of the world's 54 gigawatts of total. So that's amazing, and it's, it's, it's added uh, twice as much in 2021 as the, the IEA, the International Energy Agency even forecasted in December 2021. So it just shows that the IEA doesn't know quat. That's amazing. And squat about anything. Like they're just way off all the time and underestimated. And that China, and China can, can move, can move quickly. quickly. China uh, can briefly, move quickly some feedback for the show. We heard from Sean in uh, Dublin uh, last week with a um, an online voicemail. While well, he's back with another one. Um, uh, well, yeah, correspondent. Uh, no money involved, okay? Hi, this is Sean Hines. 
from Dublin, Ireland again, <laughs> just giving you a quick update on Ireland's renewable energy progress. Uh, we had a lot of thunder and lightning here during the week and one of our wind turbines was hit by lightning and went on fire and is now out of commission. It is Ireland's only offshore wind farm, which is crazy, considering we have so much coastal area and so much wind potential. But it was a wind farm that was installed in 2004 and it's still only Ireland's only offshore wind farm. And one of the turbines was hit and I will send you a, a video of it via email there of it on fire. Thanks. Love the show. Of course, he sent me an email and he said he couldn't find the video. Now, I did see the picture, so I, I pieced together uh, what that would sound like myself. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Very good. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's yeah. just, uh, yeah. Okay. So we'd like to hear from you. Contact us at our Gmail address, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Our handle on various multimedia social media platforms is Clean Energy Pod. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel, speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow is where you find us um, for leaving an online voicemail like. Sean did, and we love that when you do that because we love to hear what uh, what you guys sound like. And it is time for the lightning round, a fast-paced look at the week in clean energy and climate news. And Brian, it's going to have to be doubly fast this week. So let's get started. Electric Montgomery County Public Schools, one of the largest school districts in the United States, has deployed the single largest electric school bus fleet in the country. It's got a total of 86, and it'll be fully electric in 10 years, and you cannot do this fast enough. I saw um, the Biden administration, I think, uh, somewhere today uh, with a school bus uh, big announcement. So, yeah, it's clean the air, you know. Considering this, uh, along with the carbon emissions caused by 17,000 gallons of fuel that diesel buses use daily, electrifying our school bus fleets is an oppressive public health climate change an environmental property. You don't want your kids breathing diesel gas outside the bus or inside because there's fumes. Development in EU gas prices, apparently their storage of uh, natural gas is full due to a warm autumn, an unexpected warm autumn. Had one here as well, as you were saying, until it wasn't. <laughs> and prices have gone yeah. negative briefly. So, yeah. Plus, uh, it's been pointed out that there's $2 billion worth of solar modules in EU warehouses waiting to be installed. And here's some of the countries that are going for 100% renewable energy by 2030. Portugal, Netherlands, Denmark, Austria. Yeah, that's amazing. And um, they've been planning to stockpile natural gas because of the problems uh, having to get natural gas from Russia. So they were certainly planning to fill up their, you know, storage with natural gas, but they did such a good job of it and it was so warm they didn't need it. Um, yeah, they, From the they Guardian, the much. Australian state of Victoria, uh, which is closer to the equator than I thought a week ago, will likely switch from burning brown coal, the worst coal there is, for two-thirds of its electrical grid, right down to 100% renewables with storage before 2035. Uh, and it would be the fa one of the fastest transitions from a high pollution power grid to near zero emissions uh, systems anywhere. And, you know, it just shows what you can do. And we... we yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, we could be doing better, but we're not. We're aiming for 50% renewable by then. That's just, that's idiotic. Yeah. It's uh, the sooner you switch, also the more money you save. That means it's time for a CES fast fact. From Carbon Brief, China just built more offshore wind capacity in 2020 alone than the rest of the world managed in the last five years. So we'll skip that. Okay? Because I already did that <laughs> one. But here's another one. CES fast fact in 2022, oil producers reinvested only about 7% of revenues into their operations compared to 25% in 2014 during the last boom. What does that tell you, Brian? 
it tells you that they can see the writing on the wall and they're trying to get as much money out of the system as possible as it sort of heads downward. They know it doesn't pay to spend more money on fossil fuel infrastructure. And uh, you can't, uh, the numbers don't lie, okay? You can argue about things all day, but when investment money does one thing or another, you know what's going on. U.S. hydrogen fuel cell cars, uh, sales of said cars decreased to 153 in the third quarter of 2022. Brian, I bought more boxes of Girl Scout cookies in that time frame than uh, people bought hybrid, or uh, pardon me, hydrogen fuel cell cars. It's, give it up. Yeah. Not looking good for hydrogen fuel cell cars. So news, GM has unveiled the 2024 GMC Sierra. The specs thereof, this is their version of their pickup truck. It's going to have a 400 mile, 640 kilometer range, 754 horsepower. Zero to 60 is low as 4.5 seconds. Not quite as fast as, you know, the F-150. Interestingly, 800 volt architecture. And that means charging up to 350 kilowatts, which is, you know, we don't have charging times yet, but that, yeah. I always like to see that, especially now, Yeah. especially with things that are coming out a couple of years from now. Uh, it's going to tow 9,300 pounds with a payload of 1,300 pounds, can power a home for 21 days, starting at 52,000 American in 2025, but the Denali Edition 1 costs $108,695 in um, early 2024, so still over a year before that happens. Yeah. From Ars Technica, New Jersey politicians want to ban subscriptions to car, car hardware like heated seats. New Jersey, yeah. good for yeah. you. Yeah, we talked about that earlier in the show. Subscriptions for many things coming to cars and uh, could be kind of awkward if they have to ban that in some places and not in others. Tesla is continuing its growth in Asia, including Japan, and has recently um, placed their 50th supercharger in Japan, according to Tesla Rani. This is something we don't hear about a lot. Uh, we don't get a lot of Japan news, so that's interesting. I've been curious as to, base, because all of their auto manufacturing is has their head in the sand with EVs, what's Tesla doing? Mm -hmm. And will that change people's minds? <laughs> yeah. No, and Tesla still has a lot of countries that they could be expanding to and, and not that many inroads into Japan yet. Uh, concrete accounts for 8% of global emissions, but a new Department of Energy policy would use $5.8 billion from the IRA, that is the Inflation Reduction Act. We're going to start calling it IRA now because that's what the insiders do, to find ways to lower emissions. The bulk of the industry's emissions come from making the concrete powder. They have to heat that limestone in a kiln to 1,400 degrees Celsius. So that takes a lot of energy just to get limestone into cement powder. And 80% of the energy is made up of smaller operators. That's kind of one of the challenges because you have to have the cement plants close to where you're pouring it within 60 right. to 90 minutes. So that's, you know, makes sense. But more companies are beginning to look at for substitutes for portions of the cement mixture that uh, limestone is, including microalgae. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Another CES fast fact. Uh, PM Sunak is the first British PM to have more money than the monarch. Brian, he's thinking rich. He's that rich? He is that rich. Really? He is that oh, rich. Oh, my. <laughs> How, you should listen to our show. You'll learn a lot. <laughs> yeah. How many Teslas per supercharging station, you ask? Well, 750 to 1, or 80 cars on the road per stall. And that's 20% higher than the global average was a year ago. So they're actually increasing the proportion, with all the sales they're doing, they're still increasing the proportion of the chargers that are available to you. But they figure they need 750 uh, or 80 cars per ch actual charging stall. So one per 80 cars. Stationary energy storage business could grow 100 to, uh, 150 to 200% per year. Faster than cars by a mile, according to Elon Musk, who I just saw walking into Twitter holding a sink. <laughs> I had to text okay, my everything. son, what does this mean? He says it's a meme, everything. of course. Okay. Um, everything but the kitchen sink? Let that sink in. It's... Yeah. How, how, yeah, how, well... How's he so rich? Um, Tesla just, uh, yeah, they had their third quarter earnings uh, last week. And yeah, their energy business is up a lot. Of course, they've been battery constrained for, 
you know, the car business and the energy business. But as, as things ramp up, they should have enough batteries to really grow their uh, their energy storage. And finally this week, strategically burying, 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 let's say, 5% of power lines. So strategically, I don't just burying burying um, in random ones, but strategically yeah. burying them, um, power lines in Florida and places like that, uh, this is just 5% of them, could reduce the number of residents affected by, you know, heat waves, blackouts, falling hurricanes by nearly 40%, says the U.S. National Science Foundation report. I don't know why, uh, as we address climate, that we're not putting more power lines underground because you just, you, you yourself just faced that. So yep, that's because yep, my that's because the trees still had leaves on them and the wet snow hit the trees and then the branches came down on the line. So that happens this time of year if it turns up yes, like that. Yes, and when I upgraded my own house to 200 amp service, they buried the power line from the... From the alleyway, because we could do that. Yes. Well, that's our show for this week. We'll be back next week with another one. We'd love to hear from you. Show at gmail.com. The links to everything related to our show is in the show notes, so check that out. If you have anything to tell us, anything, comments, suggestions, or feedback, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. If you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app to get new episodes delivered every week. And I can't wait till next week, Brian. Yeah, see you next week. Thank you.